So welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to start the panel seven. So uh, Pravin Choudhury, professor of political science is going to lead the panel. So Pravin, you can start. All right, thank you, uh, Kang Hee, and thank you, Dan. This is such a wonderful uh, event. Uh, I got a chance to watch some of them. Uh, so I'm a political scientist uh, by training, and this topic, nationalism, cultural appropriation and design is so fascinating for me. Uh, so before we start, I wanted to share two of my observations in the last few months, uh, uh, which I think kind of sets the debate. Uh, at least that's what I feel in my mind. Uh, throughout this pandemic, I have been a regular visitor of Central Park, Columbus Circle, and grocery shop in that neighborhood. I witnessed something quite interesting, something you can still see if you wander in that location. Two statues of Columbus. Um. One in the circle and the other smaller one in the park. For months, both places were barricaded by NYPD with 24 slash 7 multiple cars belonging to NYPD. Recently, I noticed that the barricades are gone. The cars are less visible, but the cops are still there, although a little discreet. Of course, all the expense of protecting an image in public space the tab goes to tax tiers. I wonder who designed it. I wonder for that design, what the city thought will be the public response. And I wonder why these spaces now are treated as national symbols that needs to be protected at any cost on taxpayers' money. So this is a domestic uh, you know, uh, example I'm giving you. Uh, I also work on the nomads and weavers in Kashmir, Tibet, and Taurus Mountain in Turkey. The weavers in these places are very careful. When they see you with a camera, they are really, really very careful and scared. You're not a threat to their lives, but you might be a Chinese agent that has come to steal the design and their products of their products like pashmina and rugs. After all, we as consumers are so used to buying fake rugs, fake pashmina, without understanding the politics behind stealing designs for mass consumption mostly made in China, produced for American companies. So I just wanted to set that uh, my understanding uh, about uh, you know, uh, uh, what I had in mind. Let me introduce my panelist. Uh, I have my colleague from my department, Mark. He's a sociologist and he's actually uh, working on cultural appropriation. Uh, I have Mita, uh, we work on a, in a committee together and we meet quite frequently. Uh, she is a professor in the fashion business management. Uh, her specialization is luxury, fashion marketing, omnichannel, retailing, and brand strategy. She has lived and worked in North America, Europe, and Asia. It's always a pleasure to introduce your former student. So, um, welcome, Nimet. She's my former graduate student from FIT. She was in the Department of Global Fashion Management and recently received her PhD from NC State and she has an offer to teach at Appalachian State University. She has also lived and worked in Turkey, India, and United States. I had the pleasure to observe her in all three locations. So welcome all. Each of you have around 10 minutes to talk on these issues or anything which you might uh, feel uh, is interesting, and then we'll open for Q&A. We'll go in sequence. Mark goes first, uh, Mita second, and then uh, Nimet. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to share my slides, and we um, let's see. We we practiced earlier, so it's supposed to be working. Uh, share content. It's in things like these that I realize how <laughs> digitally um, illiterate I still am. But uh, hold on, let me and let me start the slideshow from the beginning. You can all see it, right? My slides, yes. 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 Right. Okay. Um, and I also try to um, stay within the time frame, so I'm actually going to set a timer <laughs> to make sure I'm not going over too much. Um, my topic might seem at first a little bit um, out of place because we're talking about design, and um, I'm going to talk about cultural appropriation and authenticity and K-pop. Um, I think the K-pop part 
you just have to see it as an example. Ultimately, what the purpose of this talk is, is to give you some food for thought to rethink what authenticity is, to rethink cultural appropriation. And um, because my research focuses on entertainment industries, um, particularly non-Western entertainment industries and the role that technology plays in these uh, industries and how that has affected um, debates about cultural appropriation, I thought that using K-pop would be the best um, example. Uh, in terms of my, my research, I am particularly interested in how um, the introduction of digital technologies, such as the internet, but also uh, social media, smartphones, um, how they have influenced uh, global culture production processes. And, in turn, how they have changed um, our understanding of cultural appropriation. Um, I have found that discussions about cultural appropriation in non-Western contexts, and particularly in the context of K-pop, are a little bit different as opposed to uh, the more traditional discussions about cultural appropriation and fashion in Europe or the West, for instance. Um, so generally, when we talk about culture production and when we talk about um, how culture is pr produced through a system, uh, systems of culture production, they change pretty slowly. Um, it takes a long time usually for that, for a culture product to go through these changes, but occasionally um, a very rapid change can occur. And this rapid change can alter, for instance, the uh, aesthetic manifestation of a cultural product. So in the case of music, uh, a rapid change can occur that changes how music is expressed or how music sounds. Um, I used in my research an approach that is called uh, the production of culture approach. And this approach argues that there are six production factors involved in the creation of culture. Um, and any changes in any of these six factors can dramatically influence um, any of the other factors, but also the culture product. So, these six production factors are changes in laws and regulation, changes in technology, which is what I focused on uh, and I will focus on for today, changes in industrial structure, um, organizational structure, uh, occupational careers, and changes in the consumer market. And that's what I focused on in K-pop as well. Um, so I looked at how digital technology influenced not only um, our understanding of authenticity and culture production, in this case, K-pop as a culture product, but also how it impacted, for instance, the, the nature of the consumer market. And in this case, it would have been the importance of um, K-pop fandoms in the production processes. Uh, so I will use the production of culture approach and I will use K-pop to mainly complicate thinking about uh, cultural appropriation. So. Um, in this case, see it as kind of an introduction to the next talks that will be coming up after me that you have this framework you could use. Um, for example, the uh, introduction of digital communication technologies like the internet or mobile phone have really facilitated the globalization of K-pop, but they've also raised questions about K-pop's cultural authenticity. Now, whether those questions are valid or not, we can have a long discussion about it, but there are interesting questions to, to think about. Um, the main argument that I want to make is an obvious one, but it's one that is often overlooked, is that cultural authenticity, which, and I'll get to that, is an important part of um, cultural appropriation, that it is universal yet relative. So what I mean by that is, is that um, every culture has culture that they consider to be authentic to groups that exist in society, but it's not necessarily expressed in a similar way, cultural authenticity. So um, this argument suggests that cultural authenticity is manufactured, it is socially constructed. That does not mean, however, that therefore it is not real, it cannot be experienced as real, it doesn't have any real consequences. But it does mean that the way in which we traditionally study cultural authenticity and uh, appropriation versus appreciation in the West might not necessarily be a good theoretical or methodological fit if you focus predominantly on non-Western cultures. So if you focus on the K-pop industry, for instance, you have to really delve into um, the circumstances that gave rise to the K-pop industry, um, as well as the main consumer group, the role of fandoms, and the nature of K-pop itself. And you will find that all of a sudden, 
this whole idea of um, cultural harm that might um, occur when people appropriate culture, um, it still exists, but we need to understand it from a different um, perspective. So just to, to make sure that we're on the same page, when we talk about appropriation, um, authenticity is important because it suggests that culture belongs within a particular setting, right? It, it suggests that if you take culture out of that setting, um, that it will either cause harm to the culture group from which you take it or to the culture product or the environment, but some harm is created. Um, but it also means that culture is authentic in a sense, that culture belongs within a certain environment or to a certain group. Um, and that is a, an approach in sociology that we've used for a very long time. Um, but it's, it's a, a tricky approach when we look at culture industries like the K-pop industry. Um, so for instance, when we focus on music um, and we look at the role that digital technology has had in the globalization of music, it's, it's, been, it's been significant, right? Um, so for music, for instance, uh, technology such as sampling and remixing has contributed to the emergence of hip hop music. Uh, Hip hop, in turn, through the internet and other digital technologies, has become uh, kind of a global music genre almost. So it's moved away from its US roots and it's now being produced all over the world. Um, yet, this globalization of hip hop has also raised questions about cultural hybridity, products that have roots in various different cultures, and where do we locate the authenticity of that culture? So. For instance, if hip hop is created in the Netherlands, um, but by Dutch rappers, can we still consider it hip hop or is it maybe a global hip hop subgenre or is it appropriation? Or uh, I saw a documentary on Mongolian hip hop artists. Um, how are we supposed to analyze Mongolian hip hop? Um, is Chinese trap music still considered a subgenre of hip hop or is the fact that um, trap music in itself is already kind of a mixed up genre of, of hip hop. And then that it's taken place in China, does that complicate our understandings of um, cultural authenticity as well? Um, similar debates have been held in um, terms of K-pop and the K-pop industry. So uh, to cut a, a long story short in terms of the origins of the K-pop industry, um, there are people who argue that K-pop is inherently a hybrid pop culture product, which means that it originated predominantly um, after, for instance, a U.S. military presence in Korea that exposed the music industry to um, uh, U.S. pop culture. But also, um, we should not forget that uh, Japanese pop culture for a long time, even though it's been banned in Korea, also it was banned for a long time, had a pretty large impact on uh, the development of the K-pop industry, for instance, through the trainee system that we all associate with K-pop, but um, idols and trainee systems were really an, an inherent part of the, the J-pop scene before that as well. Um, so some people will argue that part of K-pop's current universal appeal has to do with its roots in all these various cultures, um, but that it also makes it authentically less Korean. Um, others argue that that's absolutely not, not the case, that a culture can have multiple influences, but once it's indigenized, um, it will take on a uniquely different authenticity. So it can be considered influenced by pop culture in the US and by pop culture in Japan, but it's still ultimately considered um, authentically Korean culture. Um, why is this important? Well, because if um, K-pop is not considered um, authentically Korean, it means that, and let me go to the next slide. Oh. It means that groups like Gachi, which is the first British K-pop group, um, or Five High, which is the first Indian K-pop group, or uh, EXP Edition, which is um, the first, uh, well, kind of American K-pop group, it means that what they're doing is not necessarily cultural appropriation because we do not consider K-pop to be authentically Korean. However, if we argue that it doesn't really matter where the roots are located of K-pop, what matters is its authenticity, 
Um, then all of these three forms are indeed cultural um, appropriation, or at least problematic, and we need to talk about it. Um, I noticed I'm already going over my 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. But what is interesting about this, though, is that ultimately, authenticity is not decided per se by, by people like me who do research and I theorize about it, and it, it, it might sound interesting or not. It's not necessarily decided by the K-pop industries. But it's by fandoms. It's really interesting that the cape of fandoms, which are very global lately in their composition, they will decide for us what they consider to be authentically K-pop and what not. So, for instance, um, they BTS's Dynamite, which was produced by British uh, singer-songwriters, it is in English. It has uh, a disco beat. Uh, you could argue that that is really just a, a pop song, a Western pop song. <laughs> it is authentically considered Korean. But Kachi, um, even though one of the members is uh, Korean, uh, it's managed by a Korean company, is not considered Korean because the members were not trained in Korea. It's located in the UK. Um, and so it's really interesting that ultimately you'll find that um, in a production of culture process, Consumers play a major role in what is considered authenticity. And to wrap it up, um, what I think is something that we want to keep in mind. Oh, and I have some other examples. Uh, this is um, Aranya, which um, and Black Swan, which has one of the first um, African K-pop idols. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about that as well. Whether that is considered to be part of K-pop, but we also have um, K-pop agencies who have uh, units in, for instance, China. Um, and then there's also discussion whether they are considered K-pop, even though they have been trained in Korea with SM Entertainment. Um, but what I ultimately want to um, emphasize is, again, um, cultural authenticity is universal, but it's relative. You really need to understand the context in which it's created. Um, and in particularly a global industry like the K-pop industry, uh, consumers are such an important part of the production process that they have just as much voice in determining authenticity as culture producers have. So when we create culture um, in different settings, sometimes we have to realize that the traditional way in which we're taught to think about appropriation and uh, borrowing, it does not always fit um, and that sometimes we need to revisit them. I apologize. I went three minutes over. It's 13 past. So um, I'm going <laughs> to stop sharing. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. That was really uh, good. Uh, I normally used to think that globalization is more or less uh, a graveyard for all kind of authenticity. But actually, <laughs> you are giving a hope there, which I also somehow, somehow feel that there is a very uh, strong hope. Uh, so, all right, so with that, uh, we will uh, now hear Ita. Great. Um, if I could get the share function back so I can share my screen. Thank you. Uh, actually, before I do that, let me just say uh, thank you, Mark, for that. That was fantastic. And I'm really happy to hear, uh, you know, a more formal introduction and explanation of cultural appropriation. Um, like Praveen mentioned, although my undergraduate degree was actually in cultural anthropology, so I have a very natural interest in this topic. My specialization, really, uh, my MBA was in international luxury brand management. So I am here today uh, to speak to you a little bit more from the brand strategy marketing uh, point of view on these topics. I have also prepared uh, <clears throat> A bit of a slide here. Let me open this up. Can you guys see? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So coming back to our topics today, uh, you know, uh, the, our, our teaching labor, I, I was so fascinated by, by the topic of the symposium as a whole. Uh, and then of course, uh, our, our, our panel today on nationalism, cultural appropriation and design. So I just wanted to, you know, 
thinking of the design students, if you're here in the room with us, uh, you know, things that I get to discuss with our business students all the time, but I thought I might, you know, present two main things related to this topic. And that is in the world of luxury, talking about both geographic authenticity and cultural appropriation, specifically in luxury fashion design. And of course, all of this is just food for thought. We can tell from, from Mark's introduction, it's a very large and complex topic. Uh, so just wanted to share a few ideas, uh, you know, food for thought. Okay, so first I wanna introduce this notion of geographic authenticity and luxury. Uh, and what I'm referring to here is this notion that the place in which a product is produced is invariably connected to the level of quality of that product in the minds of consumers, whether or not the implication is valid, right? Uh, in luxury, consumers will go so far as to reject a brand or product if it is not made in the country associated with the particular specific uh, specialization in the manufacture of that product, a heritage with that product. So this is something I do sometimes with my business students. Uh, I open it up uh, just to see, uh, you know, to, to the room. I can't see the chat function, so maybe someone can jump in with their microphone. Uh, it's a little example of what I'm talking about. I like to play this, I call this game, where in the world, right? Okay, so if someone can turn on their mic, answer when I uh, uh, ask these questions. So if I ask you guys, what country makes the best leather goods? Italy. Italy, fantastic. If I ask you guys, what country makes the best watches? Switzerland. All right, I see here. Switzerland, absolutely. And I'm gonna ask you guys, which country makes the most luxury cars, luxurious cars? Germany. Germany, okay, excellent. That's exactly right. And I ask you all, how do you know this? You probably knew it from before you realized you know it, right? Now, I want to put to you that, of course, there is enormous heritage in these countries when it comes to skill and know-how of producing these goods, uh, but that is not necessarily the case today, all right? The reality today is more complicated. National identity is core to many luxury brands' DNA. The place where the goods are made must match the brand story and the product expertise in order to warrant that very high selling price. I love this photo here. Uh, it's from a Louis Vuitton ad uh, a few years ago. Uh, if you actually look at this campaign, this lovely French woman is running through the Louvre looking for her Louis Vuitton luggage and then takes off in a hot air balloon. How much more French can we get, right? Uh, but the truth is this, skill and know-how is actually borderless. The reputation for poor quality goods uh, manufactured in Asian countries, for example, is today often unfair. I can tell you, having visited several amazing Chinese factories myself uh, and seen the skill and, and handicraft uh, and the work, uh, in terms of current uh, manufacturing processes, uh, it's excellent, right? And of course, Praveen mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you know, it's so funny, part of my consulting work, I've also gone to India to work with some weavers to talk about how we can sell their goods, brand their goods to the rest of the world. Skill and know-how is not borderless. However, here's the real business truth. Even luxury brands experience pressures for profit. And so the outsourcing of manufacturing of apparel and leather goods to countries with competitive labor costs 
occurs at all positionings. It's not just a fast fashion uh, exercise. It happens even in luxury. And this has led to some seriously questionable business practices, right? Uh, I'll bring your attention to uh, European regulation uh, going back to 2013 that states that goods whose production involved more than one country shall be deemed to be hailing from the country where they underwent their last substantial economically justified processing. Uh, this has led to a wide misuse of the made in label. I do not wish to cite brands here, but I want to impress upon all of the students in the room that you must know 100%. There are luxury leather goods, shoes, clothing, apparel that is currently being prop manufactured in China. It gets shipped to Italy, gets a, they stamp one thing onto the bottom of the shoe, the brand name or whatever, made in Italy. And because of this loophole in the regulation, it gets sold to the general public. You can see in a misleading way uh, as made in Italy. And all of this is done to protect this imagined superiority of national identity and production. It has also led to some seriously troublesome activities in terms of labor, right? Uh, the, the Italian city of Prato, just outside Florence, has become the largest uh, uh, population of Chinese immigrants in all of Europe. They are running the factories. They own factories now in Italy so that they can pay Chinese prices, but still get the made in Italy stamp. The issue is real, right? The implications are large. Okay, I'm gonna put a pause on that and turn for a moment now to the topic of cultural appropriation. It seems like two different things, but I, I'm gonna make the case to you today that they are in fact combined. So of course, Cultural appropriation, you know, just to provide a, a design related definition, taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts of another culture without permission. It is likely to be harmful when the source of this inspiration is a minority group that has been oppressed and exploited or when the object of appropriation is particularly sensitive, such as sacred objects. Now, how does this apply to luxury, specifically luxury fashion design? <laughs> My friends, <laughs> there is no shortage of finding cultural appropriation examples in fashion luxury design. Uh, it, are there are I'm sure fashion historians that can and talk about this more, but I think often, although Yves Saint Laurent was the first uh, luxury couturier to model, uh, have a black model on his runway. This is an image from his very famous spring summer 1967 collection, uh, completely inspired by Bambara art. Not a woman of color, model of color to be seen. If you look at here, the examples, <clears throat> another big one, Christian Dior, spring 2007, uh, Chinoiserie at its maximum, and more recent examples, right? Uh, the Gucci turban scandal, Marc Jacob wearing dreads, Ralph Lauren selling a shearling uh, with a native motif right now on his website, selling for uh, $2,400. This is one of my favorites. I'm also watching my time, so I'm going to keep moving. Uh, this is a Chanel collection from 2011, and the review in Vogue clearly tells us that Karl Lagerfeld never went to India. <laughs> it's more inspiring not to go to places. And of course, everything that looked intricately Indian was actually made by Chanel's ateliers in Paris. And the reviewer, Tim Blanks, that was some kind of tour de force, right? Uh, you might even argue that the entire aesthetic 
that has been dominating luxury fashion for the past five years is streetwear, a complete appropriation of Black American culture. And happening at brands everywhere. And yet the only brand to actually hire a black male designer, what it has been Louis Vuitton uh, uh, and hiring Virgil Abloh. Again, massive appropriation. So of course, appropriation is harmful. It invalidates entire cultural communities, distorts and diminishes storied ethnic histories false decontextualized caricatures. We see this so much in fashion. And of course, adding insult to injury, this in no way ec economically benefits uh, the cultural groups from which this borrowing is taking place. I leave you with this. Again, just food for thought. Luxury brands still operate as colonial superpowers. They adopt, ideas without credit or compensation. So that colonial thinking, the manifestation of the power imbalance, which is deeply rooted in colonialism, made in France, made in Italy, right? Uh, and the historical subordination and exploitation of minority groups without credit or compensation for their work. And also, it really demonstrates the hypocrisy that is the privilege of the powerful. While luxury brands fiercely protect notions of geographic authenticity for themselves, they do not yet fully respect the cultural or national identities of others and their contribution to design across all of luxury. I hope that gives you some food for thought. I leave you there. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mita. Uh, actually, uh, I feel that uh, we are on the same wavelength in terms of understanding the problem. Before I uh, turn on to Nimet, I just want to add something very interesting to what you're saying. So I don't know, I asked this uh, to Nimet, and I don't think she has seen it. These days, if you go to Turkey, you see labels which says made in Turkey, weaved in India which is a very fascinating concept for me because in a way it's also answering your question because I feel they at least start acknowledging that they have been weaved in India. And the idea that India has good weavers also kind of gets in. So that's one aspect. Uh, and the other aspect really is that now, even in Northeast India, which is very close to say Tibet and different kind of cultural you know, uh, heritage, suddenly are weaving something which is like kilims. They have never seen kilims in their life, but now Indian market is flooded by kilims, which design comes, of course, from uh, the Turkish you know, traders. So something to think about. I don't know how to explain it, but I thought I'll just throw it out. So maybe you have some answer. All right, so with that, let me turn over to Nimet. Hi, Parveen. Uh, you asked me about the rugs and Turkish carpets. I looked online and I haven't seen it. You probably yeah, know, I know more about it than me, <laughs> but I will check it out when I go to Turkey. But yeah. Turkey has high labor costs. That might be the reason. So um, before I start, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And that is an amazing lecture, both Mark and Mita. I, I am impressed. So. I'm here as a former student of Paravin, and he is one of the inspiring person who kind of connected me and Soham, and we started the fashion brand. And it, it was one of uh, my dream that talk about it in one of uh, Paravin's panels. So I will talk about my experience uh, launching a fair trade brand and how I end up, end up doing PhD uh, and becoming a, uh, becoming a, a professor at a, uh, at, in North Carolina. So my research area is fair trade and I love working with people passionate about fair trade and ethical fashion. As we are discussing today for, with Miha and Josh, there is a fine line between culture appreciation and 
appropriation and as a fashion um, designers and buyers, we always need to be fully alert. Um, we are so lucky living in a diverse world and interact and uh, talk to different cultures daily. So today I will talk about how I was a Turkish uh, student selling Indian crafts. I was, um, after completing my graduate program at FIT in 2010, I launched a fair trade apparel brand uh, with one of my cohorts, uh, Soham Dave. And during this journey, I learned a lot about Indian culture and traditions and Soham Dave was my guide and he was happy to do it. Soham was, um, actually, he is a very talented designer who creates beautiful textures and clothes using traditional techniques. Um, and I was on the brand development. We used uh, Bandani, which is hand tie, hand block printing, appliques, and natural dyed fabrics. Uh, so Ham Dave, um, I call him So Ham Dave, but I think the correct pronunciation is Dave. Um, he worked with artisans in India, and he designed uh, he uh, designed new motifs. Uh, he changed it a little bit, keeping the origins of the designs, and we try to use modern silhouettes. I will share a slide. Uh, Uh, here, um, I put a few uh, styles that we did together. Um, here is a bandani, the one on the left is a hand tie, and this is hand block printing. And the uh, five models on the right are, um, here's a, a newer collection that actually won an award, um, and it shows how the brand progressed using all the traditional techniques. During uh, during that time, I heard stories about how uh, women artisans were exploited and they were poorly compensated. Uh, they were very vulnerable and they lacked the resources and training to compete in the market and um, also gain a sustainable income. Uh, most of the time they use this income in their communities or for their kids education. Um, and I learned more about fair trade, which answers all these questions. And I wanted to focus my research on how to motivate people to use fair trade practices. Um, especially a majority of fair trade companies, they are selling um, items uh, deliberately created uh, with the aesthetics and techniques of the uh, non-Western cultures. They are uh, working with local communities and they provide resources and education. However, uh, even though that's the intent, it's not always uh, the result. Um, there is, uh, they start with the good intentions and then they end up uh, using their uh, culture for their own benefits. Uh, for example, um, I, I would like to ask a question. Uh, it's a very, when you think of India, is wearing a sorry a cultural appropriation? Um, and if I'm not sure if I can ask a question to audience or chat. People can answer in the chat. Yeah. Do and you we'll think read wearing it to you. Um, sorry is a cultural appropriation. I would say it really depends on the occasion. That that's true. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, it depends if you are invited to a Indian event, and uh, then it should be okay. But if you are wearing it as a costume, that could be a major red flag. Or if you are selling an item or designing a sari without telling the origin, and um, so it's always a good practice to ask and to learn. 
um, we have a few questions if you want to check for culture, if you are um, in the fine line between the culture appropriation and you want to double check yourself, do you understand, do I understand the significance of this attire, tradition and custom? Am I honoring the culture or simply uh, imitating it, using it my for my own benefit? And then am I creating a stereotype that might hurt those who are from a specific cu culture? Also, um, when, uh, for example, uh, when you uh, go to Turkey and if you visit a mosque, uh, it's um, cultural that you, it's the Islamic culture that you wear a hand, uh, headscarf. So, um, is it like, um, are you doing this as a personal opportunity to experience and respect the culture? Or are you doing this for a photo op so you can just post online, Instagram, or any other social media? These are the questions we always need to check uh, to make sure we are not, uh, we are careful. <laughs> so I would like to give another example um, that uh, one of my experience uh, uh, when we are uh, working with Soham Day. We did a collection of Bandani, Thai guy is the first photo that I shared. Um, uh, actually, I'm still sharing. So this is a, a Bandani photo, the one on the left. Um, when we did this collection, we did very different uh, sizes and different silhouettes and different fabrics. The original traditional way is to have countless small knots on silk fabric, so you it will shrink when you dye and open uh, open the uh, fabric, remove the tight knots. But in our experiments, it, it has uh, different looks and different shapes, um, which uh, was um, also in the picture. So when uh, we did that, uh, we have to, uh, it was our responsibility to educate our target audience. So we explained what Bandani is and what's the process and uh, how we changed the original way of doing Bandani and how we implemented in our collection. Uh, we also uh, told uh, our uh, cu customers that it is an uh, Indian origin, and we are not the owner of this styles. We are using uh, we are using as an inspiration. So we um, had the uh, opportunity to work with uh, really different artisan groups in India, and Soham made it a major point to have them involved in the design process. So he comes together with different groups and they work on uh, the designs and styles as a workshop and he, get, he gets their feedback. Um, I really appreciate working with him, but as I was more involved in fair trade, I moved into the research part because I really wanted to see what is the uh, involvement of uh, fair trade practices in, in USA and I did a research looking at how um, actually a fair trade fashion is way behind uh, in in USA compared to Europe and we are we have a lot of work to do but I am so excited that there are there is some um, um, like students, especially students, are really interested in sustainable textiles, in fair trade. So I'm very excited to promote fair trade in my classes and speaking with you. Uh, I didn't want to go over time, so um, if you have any questions or... Thank I you, Nimesh. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you. I was also branding uh, both Nimet and Soham are FIT uh, former graduate students, uh, uh, and uh, I have seen them on different sites, uh, and I'm very proud uh, of their work. We all are. Uh, 
there are so many uh, things I can ask, uh, <laughs> but I will restrain myself and. Uh, uh, pardon me, has... I want to add one more uh, point. Yeah. Even though I'm no longer uh, doing uh, the brand development, Soham is successfully working back in India and he is uh, working on full time and he is uh, now designing for the Indian market. So I'm very proud of you and uh, proud of him that continuing the mission. Thank you. All right, so open for questions. I have already uh, posed a few questions, uh, but let's take some more and then any of you can actually uh, uh, jump in. Uh, so, so uh, other people are, are going to type in their questions, but meanwhile, um, as a person who teaches this uh, heritage of Asian art and civilization, I'd like to ask some questions to Mark and Mita uh, in regard to the nationalism. Like these days, some countries are very proud of their national heritage and um, they want to create a brand out of their national heritage for the sake of their own citizens and um, you know their own economy and so forth. Um, so, but but sometimes these nationalistic interests are sort of exclusive, right? Like, a, um, but you know, these days people are more and more transnational or borderless. Um, so, in this case, uh, you know, people who are coming from a specific nation and sort of a representative of those national culture uh, is. Uh, is that a pretty privileged position, right? As opposed to start on their own uh, without any background. Um, so, uh, can you comment on a little bit of more like uh, this? Um, uh, how can I say? Um, you know, countries are trying to make uh, their national heritage brands. Uh, you know, like a um, more like a um, how can I say? Um, sort of a cultural hegemony, you know, some countries, they really want to be a hegemony in their region. So can you comment a little bit about cultural appropriation and national interests? Kang Yi, who are you directing that question to? Oh, both Mark and Mita. So Mita can speak first. Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with promoting uh, the skill, know-how, heritage, traditions, and artistic and design, uh, you know, history uh, that's being produced within a, a, a country, right? Um, you know, in terms of the discussion today of cultural appropriation, I think what's important to understand is that we are citing our references, you know, design is all about inspiration, right? And uh, in, in fashion design, this is what designers are inspired by art, travel, everything that they see around them, right? Uh, and again, in the context of, of my talk today, I would just say, you know, if any countries that aren't traditional superpowers are advocating for themselves and their own heritage, I would support that, right? I think that the Generation Z consumer, they are going to hold everyone up to that bar of authenticity, right? Um, I, I I don't see, uh, I just don't see most of the uh, countries that are now coming to the fore and expressing their voice in this way. It's not going to lead to a cultural hegemony situation uh, anytime soon. Uh, these are, you know, uh, minority represented, previously exploited, you know, previous colonial uh, or, you know, colonies coming to the fore. Uh, that's what I have to say about that. Mark, what do you think? No, I, I, I agree in, in terms of, for instance, with the K-pop industry, um, it's a, still a pretty young industry. I mean, it's, it's been around for a while in its current form, but it's still pretty young. And I think it has every right to, despite discussions, whether K-pop is or, or an original music form or just a mixture of different forms thrown together for commercial purposes, I don't think it really matters. I think at this point in time, it's really important that um, Korea, South Korea, has a pop culture product that represents something different than the normal Western 
cultural hegemony that has existed for so many years. And so that counter force, I think at some point it will either disappear or it will change. But for, for now, I think um, as long as we are aware that while countries are doing it, there are still problems with it. Like who is included in those representations and who is not, that is sometimes problematic. But in itself, I think they're doing it mostly for um, political reasons in a way. They're doing it because it's it's been necessary for them to privilege themselves in the region. Um, and so I, I don't see a problem with it necessarily either to be to be honest um as long as as long as it's transparent as long as we can address issues such as um uh, going back to k-pop such as um who is or is not a, a representative of k-pop for instance uh, and you need to otherwise you will get groups like exp edition who are all white who try to get um the global money and uh, trying to take that away again, um, and and I think it's important that they put their their stamp on it. Um, I have a follow up question uh, 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 for Mita. Uh, I understand what uh, uh, Mark is saying, but to a large extent, when you go at micro level, these weavers, these designers, it's their heritage. You know, so the example which you gave is a very disturbing example that you bring everything in Italy and blah, 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 and that you say made in Italy. You see, uh, that's where I have really a problem that these simple motives uh, actually is a lot of history there, hundreds of years of history. And someone taking away uh, is just very painful. I remember I met someone who was involved in rug and pashmina business. And he said, I don't care. These are conflict ideas, uh, areas. I don't care about their pain. What I care, how much uh, 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 things you can bring here and how much profit we can make. And this guy was a very prominent guy. And for, from his mouth, these words coming uh, sounded like a crime, sounded like really very inhuman. So you see, you cannot deny that there is a very strong heritage aspect in these things. You know, which is kind of uh, being uh, becoming a graveyard in the context of globalization. I guess I would just say to that, Praveen, that, that you know, obviously, I, I, I said the reality is harsh, and I don't want to. That that is the core message here. But you know, there are people doing it right, right? In, in that in that luxury design space, we do see you know houses like Hermes, top of the pile, luxury pile. They have never. They have always been very clear, right? This is the silk. This is the treatment. We're working with people in India, um, you know, uh, designers like Dries van Noten, who has, you know, all the time on every label for decades now, right? This has been woven in India. All the embroidery is done in India, which is that is their geographic authenticity, right? Weaving, handiwork, embroidery. Um, so there are examples of doing it right, and even the the big guys, the major players, right? Uh, very recently, uh, Dior uh, last year did a, a, a collection with, uh, you know, uh, uh, artisans from uh, Mali, I believe, uh, and, you know, showed the artisans. If you go to the product page, this is the history of it. This is the this is the weaving house. These are the weavers. This is the history of the product. So there are ways to move forward. Right, um, but yeah, of course, what you're describing is exactly the tragedy of what's been happening uh, for the past couple of hundred years. Right, absolutely. There are questions in the chat box. Can anyone read that, please? I will read it for you. So, uh, okay. Suku asked you, the you. Suku asked the question to Mark: Should we distinguish traditional culture versus popular culture? Hmm. Sorry, I thought I'm mute. Uh, for purposes of what I look at, um, I, it needs to be um, se separated because for, for, for instance, pop culture, music, and um, the whole idea of digital technology influencing it, um, it's a lot clearer. Like pop music in itself, it's already very difficult to make the argument that there is one authentic pop music source because even 
I talked about rap and hip hop, but even rap and hip hop borrowed from different musical traditions, right? It borrowed from all over the world. So it's a hybrid pop culture in itself. I think my interpretation of traditional culture is a little bit more tied to history and to heritage. And, um, and I think that is a little bit more tricky, I think, to argue that, um, that that would be the same as a K-pop product that mixes R&B and hip hop, but also Korean language and other Korean influences. Um, I, I think that, yeah, I think we, we do probably need to make a distinction a little bit. And then one more question to Mark, uh, it's from Amani. Uh, do you think Korean people should say if a group is appropriating K-pop or not instead of fans? Like a, a, if an if a non Korean group is performing, yeah, K pop is it like um, Korean people should say or fans? Well, that that is the interesting thing about the involvement of fandoms, actually, I, because I have the impression that it's not the domestic Korean fans who are getting involved in those discussions, but it's the global fandoms who are calling out other groups and uh, agencies and producers who are trying to to mimic it. Um, so most of the controversies, and I think that is also part of the social media culture, um, that people use social media as kind of like the political platform as well. So you already get a group of people who are very politically aware, socially aware, um, particularly global fandoms who are interested in K-pop. They're different from people that are interested in, let's say, mainstream Ariana Grande, because you already are interested in a different music form. Um, and I don't know if... I know on the, some of the board discussion boards, Korean fans um, will call out other other groups, but it's predominantly I find the the, the global fandoms um, that are more offended by groups like Kachi or um, EXP Edition, uh, and so I I don't know why that is to be really honest. I don't know if it's because they're more comfortable um, speaking up about it and being confrontational about it, or um, that maybe they're more present in in the on the global fandom boards that other people read in in English. I I don't know, but um, I don't think it's really the duty of of per se of Korean people though to speak up. But I think it's the duty of us to educate ourselves and to understand when something is appropriate and not. But um, that's my opinion. <laughs> we All right, I think our times. Uh, we have time. Some more time. Yeah, Praveen, I wanted to say that uh, we have a lot of questions, so uh, we want to continue our uh, discussion. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Room. I mean, you guys are the boss. That's why I didn't want it to hog your time. Of course, I'm very happy. I have we the have best a, speakers We have a 30 today, minutes. So. Yeah, Can 30 I minutes. actually yeah, jump yeah, in yeah, for yeah, a yeah, second yeah, before you get to the next yeah. question? Because I was really yeah. interested by what Mark was saying, and it reminded me of something that Yuni Kawamura said in a presentation she made with Mark earlier this year. Appropriate culture. She said that people in the Japanese diaspora are offended by it, but people in Japan are not. And the argument that she made is that when you're in Japan as a Japanese person, you're not a victim of oppression. And therefore, that power dynamic is not happening. But if you're part of the Japanese diaspora, you experience being a minority and being an oppressed minority. And therefore, appropriation of your culture feels that much more oppressive is at least my memory of what she said. So maybe that's- Completely related to the power dynamic. Fundamentally, when we're talking about appropriation, this is it, right? Uh, Gucci selling a turban for $800. <laughs> and every Sikh person is like, hi, actually the history of the turban is that we are all equal. We are all, you know, that is actually what it, it means, right? To I'm the so community. glad you did that. Not today. to mention, that you know in new york city after 9 11 if you were a man wearing a turban in the streets you were assaulted yes. right hey yes. let's dial it back another 20 years and that's what was going on so you know where the person you know if you are appropriating a cloth something on your exterior your hair your something from another culture and if that person who is from that culture is wearing this, they might be discriminated against 
right? They might have a, a difficult life experience. The fact that you can wear dreads or a turban and whatever, you're not black or you're not Sikh or whatever, you can do this because of your privilege. This is where it's uh, appropriation, right? Uh, and not not necessarily just a pre appreciation or, 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 you know, it's an exact copy and I'm white, so I can get away with it without any of the negative connotations. So I think it's really essential when we're talking about this cultural appropriation that you have to relate it to the power dynamic. Thank so you, I, go... I totally agree yeah. with you. <laughs> so I want to go to, uh, 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 what is it, uh, Nimet. Uh, there is a question from Shiva Shankari. What were the challenges in selling Indian products as a Turkish entrepreneur? Thank you for the question. Uh, it was a big challenge. I was educating myself when I was educating the people. So I talk about my passion for crafts and for beautiful products. But it was always a challenge at the beginning, but it's just um, uh, telling your story right and giving the credit and always listening from the people who really understand. Okay, thank you. And then now I'm moving to a bigger question. Uh, first from uh, Daniel Lubinson Wilk. Uh, I think it's for everybody. So uh, if we discourage consumers from buying clothes that does not come from their culture, because wearing it would involve cultural appropriation, does that limit markets and profits for producers who are not engaging in cultural appropriation? I'm not sure yeah. I understand that question completely. So yeah, let me try to ask it again. It was poorly worded. So it came out of the question of is wearing a sari culturally appropriating, right? That's what made me think of it. So on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, if we go around telling white people not to wear saris, does that limit the market for saris? And does that then harm the manufacturers of saris who are not engaged in cultural appropriation because it is their culture? Um, it just, I, I think Namet answered that question beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. right? So yeah. it, it make sure it's not a close to. Okay, never mind. No, I, I think uh, honestly, it, it's just a thing, right? I, I don't know how much a sari in particular is in demand uh, outside of India to wear it. Uh, it would be worn in a different kind of way. Right, reimagined, restyled. Uh, perhaps the fabric from a sorry could be used in something else. That's how we would see it from a business person in other markets, right? And in fact, that's some of the work I'm doing with the weavers, right? Take your skill, uh, you know, think about more of a Western aesthetic, right? Design style and present it to them. And I really don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's how you grow the market, right? It's a, just an exact copy situation that gets a bit tricky. And Mita, I want to ask you about that. Do you tell these weavers don't make an exact copy because then people will be appropriating your culture? Is that one of the concerns you have about it? Oh, or is it just I, no, not. the weavers aren't copying themselves? <laughs> I'm worried about the European brands copying yeah. the weavers, right? Well, let but me let me restate what it. What I'm trying to say is what the European brands are doing is taking that skill, right, or the fabric or the handiwork, putting it on, um, you know, a Western silhouette, and then repurposing it without giving credit or what have you payment, right? So I am telling weavers to get in the game. Right, uh, design things that also fit a Western aesthetic in terms of garments or, or whatever it is, and you you own the craft. It is your weave, right? So that's what's going to expand the market on behalf of the weavers. And I I don't I also don't want to discourage European luxury brands from collaborating with these with with, with these makers, right? But pay them. <laughs> Yeah, but I want to be back to add to what you're saying. You will see the Killam example I gave you that these are weavers in Northeast, uh, you know, uh, India and on the streets of Delhi, particularly in D Delhi Hut, you go and you think, oh, my God, I'm in Turkey. I'm buying a Killam, but it is just that, uh, you know, so, I mean, to some extent, I agree with what Mita is, uh, you know, saying, but I still I because I work with very hardcore 
uh, uh, weavers, uh, Pashmina weavers, and I know how much uh, heritage is there. I just feel too scared that it will be gone someday. You know, I, I want to just more. follow up one more thing with Mita about this, though, because you're telling yeah. these weavers to repurpose in a Western silhouette. Why aren't you just telling them make the exact same thing you make for the domestic market and try to sell that to Western people? Because it's a different aesthetic. It, it, you know, the, that's what's narrowing. If, if the question is, I'm a weaver. How do I expand my business, my business model? How do I reach target audiences beyond my, my local consumption, right? This is what you would do in any business. You look at the other country, you understand their tastes and their preferences. You have a unique selling point, an uh, embroidery skill or, or, or a certain fabric, but then you uh, redesign your offer to suit the aesthetics and the preferences of other nations, other markets. This is just how one expands their business when you're selling a product. You understand? So, whereas the traditional uh, designs, let's say, that feature this kind of handiwork has, even in modern India today, a very small uh, pocket of, of, of actual use and choice of use, bring it to the fore in terms of designs and preferences, silhouettes that are uh, will be embraced in other places and even contemporary Indians today. Mita, I hope we can continue this conversation another time. I think it's really interesting. Thank you. So there was a question uh, by Alexandre. So uh, here, aren't fashion institutions perpetuating in some way the geographical hierarchy described by Professor Roy? Uh, Bring up it, it, it dis, disappear. Oh, Roy. As they concentrate talent from all over the world in New York, London, and Paris, how can our institutions advocate for decentralizing the fashion geography while playing a major role in it? It was posted at 2 21 p.m. So I guess it's for Mita. Oh, it's for, um, I agree. We are, we, we are part of the, we exactly are part of the, the issue. Um, I did attend a very interesting session right here this morning that talked about decentralizing fashion education, right? I can tell you from uh, the point of view of our department uh, at FIT, uh, you know, the, we are business students, right? So when we're, we're not a fashion history department and et cetera, et cetera, a liberal arts department, but we have revised our curriculum, right? For our new curriculum for our associate's degree that's launching in the fall. When we're talking about fashion history, we are moving it past just the European, uh, you know, point of view, right? So this is how we do, but I absolutely think that uh, criticism is essential. Right, uh, it's going to take longer for fashion centers to move out of just uh, Paris, London, uh, New York, Tokyo is, you know, represents, uh, but it's happening. It is happening, but institutions, I agree. We have been part of the problem. The thing is to acknowledge that and to change our curriculum, which we're trying to do in our department. I should say. Now, let's move to Joey Mao's question. Uh, what is your. Of view, point of view on the relationship of cultural appropriation and power. We talked about it a little bit, but who is actually capable of appropriation? Um, if, if I could add something to that, I, I think part of, at least for my discipline in sociology, part of the problem has been with uh, literature on, on cultural appropriation. It's very um, Western centric, so it's, it's predominantly, and it makes sense because that's why it emerged in post colonialism and so on. But um, cultural appropriation can also take place in non Western um, regions, it's just that there are different dynamics involved. And so, one of the things that I always um, encourage students to do is to think about <laughs> cultural appropriation is just a it's, a, it's a basically a term for. Um, uh, a tool of oppression. That's what you do. You, if you are in a position of power, um, either historically or currently economically, and you can take the culture of a minority group, 
Um, you can do that anywhere. It, it's not, but in sociology, for instance, we focus too much on colonial relationships and uh, the appropriation of culture from by the West from other parts of the, the world. But as I, not to use again my K pop example, but the K pop industry has um, appropriated from um, Indian culture a lot of um, religious symbols, a lot of uh, many other different cultural symbols, but we rarely hear about that. Uh, but it's a very, and I can understand because the dynamics are different because India in itself is a huge powerhouse when it comes to cultural production in its region, but it still is a form of cultural appropriation as well that I think needs to be included because then you expand uh, the, the concept of cultural appropriation and who can appropriate um, as long as there's inequality, as long as that's, as you, as you said before, as long as there is like um, um, a, a group that can appropriate and has the power to do so in a group that has very less um, um, lesser tools to resist that, I think um, then you create the situation for it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so Kiara has uh, several questions and comments, so I'm going to read it. So uh, it says, uh, oftentimes cultural appropriation makes said uh, garments less accessible to those of the actual culture, particularly uh, price-wise. And then it's related in that uh, it then gets lumped into the process of supply and demand. Um, supply and demand then becomes the uh, justifier. Uh, and then even for the creator of a culture, textiles and uh, labor to complete the techniques become inaccessible to them. Um, so, you know, does any of you want to comment on this process of like a deep probably, you know, uh, you know, like uh, in in uh, in uh, indigenous culture, being deprived of their own ownership of the crafts. I, I would like to comment on them because uh, ethical fashion is always uh, mistakenly uh, feels like it's expensive, but it is just they don't have the power as the mass uh, bigger brands and luxury brands. So there are there can be some collaborations uh, with uh, the brands or. The brands needs to have uh, like when um, especially fair trade brands, they don't know the market, they don't have the marketing power. So the way they work is they um, come together under under fair trade federation and they combine their marketing power and they join the trade shows all together. But they still need the support um, of like even um, stores, um, I think American American Eagles were was working with a Guatemalan uh, brand to make some uh, handbags, uh, backpacks for uh, with uh, the fashion trade brand. So the collaborations are needed to really help them. Also, um, there are surveys for consumers to why they prefer. Uh, ethical or fair trade brand, it's always the price. Price is the biggest issue for consumers. So there's a lot of work to do, but uh, I hope the companies don't use shortcuts. They really need to work and learn and find the brands that have the talent and also now how or the local markets. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I think as uh, professors, we want you know we want to consider uh, Jean Amato's question. So um, another question for Mark that comes up a lot in my global martial arts and East Asian cinema classes, taught by uh, Professor Jean Amato. So much of the pop culture, film, fashion, and arts events that are promoted globally are heavily supported, disseminated, and distributed by governments and funded and uh, quite often censored. Uh, either overtly or just uh, by what projects artists the filmmakers are selected. Um, so uh, how do we address this more effectively in our classes or what, uh, how do you address this in your class? I guess it's to Mark. Um, I, I, I address it by starting off with a history um, of the soft power uses of, of the cultures. Um, so when I talk about uh, the Korean wave, for instance, um, before that, I've already talked about uh, the whole concept of soft power and using culture to create um, 
kind of like a mythical impression of a country that is kind of like a PR instrument. Um, and so when we look at uh, movies and films and other products um, that are, are supported heavily by government su uh, subsidizes and uh, promoted by Japanese government or Korean government, um, we always have to be aware or ask the questions, um, what, what is the image is, that is represented? And go beyond that, um, what is not represented? So who is not included in K-pop representations or in uh, K-drama films? Um, and look at the structures as well. So what, what does the censorship regulation actually look like? Has it changed in recent years? Um, and I know in, in Korea, it has definitely changed over over time as, as um, particularly governments have changed and um, more money is coming in, but it, it's, it's just really important, I think, to, to point it out, to point out that um, many of these large movements are government-sponsored movements and, and that it might or might not affect the product that we're looking at, but it definitely creates a very one-sided image of a very complex and diverse culture that um, we need to to question. I don't know if that answers to your question, Jean. So, India, can you unmute Jean so that um, she can actually jump in? I see her on the screen. That's a, a, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I love your um, line, soft power uses of culture that create this master narrative. Um, what's interesting too is when that's you know exported and um, to an audience that maybe only sees uh, three Korean films you know in a year, they're getting one you know of just very select messages that they absorb as authentic. And I think um, what I what I meant at the end of the question is you know the, where in here are the governmental powers and you know even just economic powers reinforcing um, ideas of cultural authenticity, you know, and I, I'm very interested in this also because I look at Taiwan and China both, you know, claiming authenticity. So I think that's very helpful to look at the soft power aspect of it. I have never used that term, so it's very helpful. Thank you. I would add to that also look at maybe um, government initiatives that sponsor certain industries, um, but not other industries. Because ultimately, the money that you get in will also help you to distribute your your product, um, and and the regulations and policies that are put in place in a country that help the the export of those products as well. Those are very small things, but um, it helps a lot in terms of a product getting some global uh, renown in that regard. I want to jump in there just to this point. I think it depends where it's coming from. Right, because I was living in Korea when Parasite came out, <laughs> so I can tell you uh, it was a you know so much of my experience there was this a uh, generational divide. So absolutely everyone that was my senior hated the movie, right? Koreans absolutely hated the movie because no one they're allergic to this uh, conversation about class and wealth. In, in Korea, right? So, and, and I'm sure, but that's an industry as a whole, the film industry that has received a lot of government support, right? So you still have the independent voices coming out there, upsetting enough people at home and being celebrated depending where you, where you fall on the argument. <laughs> So is uh, is there any more question? It's already two fifty. Um, so um, you can hang out here. Uh, but we have a uh, panel eight history of geography of cotton, which is actually related to this history of you know discussion of nationalism and um, of cultural appropriation. Um, you can stick around and uh, you know have uh, uh, next panel. Thank you so much. Thank, for, thank you, Kang. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, and uh, thank uh, Mita, Mark, uh, and Nimet uh, for joining the panel. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.